Good picture. Yeah, Toman Head, I believe. That's like the capital city for the uh, Shan Chan. It's the captured capital city for the Shan Chan. Yeah. Like they're in they're in the land of like the main characters, their continent, but they came from the west, so straight up invaders from across the sea. Oh yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they made that clear. They kind of hinted at it, but not really like they they didn't make it like super clear that they're invading the whole the whole country or whole continent. Yeah, that makes more sense. Love a good colonization story. A little Pocahontas, dare I say. <laughs> Who's John Smith? Who is John Smith? I guess. Well, there's some uh, some juicy stuff to get into right off the rip, like right when this starts. Yeah, my first uh, set of slides. So normally I try to do like char individual characters. And mm -hmm. what I decided to do for this episode is I have it broken down into Forsaken. Mm -hmm. uh, so their whole, the whole, anything that has Forsaken in it, their storyline. And then I have uh, the girls because the girls were um, yep. knocked out in the Together. last, yeah, knocked out in the last uh, episode. And then Perrin and then Rand. So, okay. And then I, my last uh, six slides are Varen because she has her own little arc in this episode. Yes. So, um, what it, what it, I mean, what are your, this, this whole, this whole scene is kind of, kind of interesting they took a, a pretty decent stab at like how to convey what the Sean Chan are like and I just wanted to get your opinion just to see how well it lines up for somebody that's not familiar already with the material or whatever you wanted to talk about for this scene like what what do you what do you mean what what kind of information are you fishing for out of me I'm I'm fishing for like how do you feel this culture operates because like they're like I get a feeling when I when I read about the Sean Chan I get a feeling about how they function and operate in their own little society and uh, part of part of the story is um, the different cultures and things like that like we actually see lots of different cultures in this episode because we see kind of like Kind of like how the the white cloaks think and operate, and you could argue that that's a, their own culture, and the Shan Chan and the Aiel. Like we see a lot of different stuff happening as far as like expectations and uh, things like authority or or whatever. So I was just this was a good world building episode. Absolutely, I loved it. So what I take away is. I mean, they, they have their own unique vibe, culture. There, I mean, it is a culture, but I mean, just a, a presence or a vibe you get from the Sean Chan. But to me, it's very similar to a, not one for one, but kind of like a Roman or a massive colonization, even like the Mayans or the Aztec, where they come in, they fuck shit up, they take over, they make you submit. But once you submit... Like you pay your tribute and you Gucci, you do what you want to do. You live, you know, you live your life. That's how like the Romans were, uh, you know, whenever they started accepting multiple religions within their country, like we don't care what you do as long as you know, we're the top dog and we take our peace. And once we take our peace, you live the way you want. Um, and so I think that when I see the Sean Chan, I see a lot of, mixed people under one banner mm -hmm. in a way um yeah just kind of submitting to the sean chan rule i mean it's definitely different i can see the contrast to you know like uh the rest the rest of the cultures the white cloaks or the uh Asadai and you know what we have seen haven't seen too much about the IEL, um right but 
from what I could see from the Shan Chan, that definitely looks like they come in. They're, they're conquerors, they're colonizers. They want to come in, they want to take over. But, uh, like, you know, I think um, it was either this episode or the last episode, they go to the town um, that was taken over. And one of the guys there had taken over a keep. I think Perrin was talking to him, maybe. Yeah, it was whenever he made it back to the city uh, where they all got taken and the guy was taking over some ladies in and he was like, it was better whenever the Sean Chan were here because at least they left us alone. Better than the White Cloaks. I I just want to say for the record that anybody that hates on the show but no, has read the books and understands the Sean Chan, this is not, this is not uh, more than maybe like 10% off of what they're like. So... The fact that you pulled that basically flat footed because I didn't prepare you for that question at all. Like that answer is pretty damn close. Like there's some some uh detailed things that, you know, we could we could kind of I could quote unquote educate you on on what the book is like, but they portrayed the Shan Chan pretty well if that's what you're gathering from it. That means that like the show watchers are getting the same message just delivered differently than what the book than what the book is like i i can't tell you how happy that makes me like every time i doubt every time i see a post on facebook dumping on the show and i'm you know i i dump on the show too and my you know when i watch the episodes because it's not um like perfect in my mind but if you're getting all that from the show then you know rafe Rafe clearly has a vision in mind and is delivering on that vision somehow, whether it translates to the book readers or not is, uh, is, you know, I think the debate is mostly siding with the readers, but if the show watchers can gather that same perspective of the Sean Chan, then, then that's a good thing. And part of the reason you and I are even having these discussions is I was griping to you about the show and saying, you know, it's missing this and this and this. And your reaction to that was those all happened in the show. What are you talking about? And like, that was a big, you know, I was, I was pretty shaken up when you told me that. And I had to like go back and try to find those scenes and they're not in this place as I expected them, but they did, they did exist. And you know, that's why I gave the show a chance and why we're having these talks is you're seeing stuff that you know i wasn't looking for because i wanted to be mad yeah and, i mean I'm, this, I'm glad you feel that way and anytime i'm asking you a question like this like i i'm not trying to catch you flat-footed or unprepared i just like your honest reaction helps me uh buy into what the show is doing because you know it, it it's different um, but it yeah. make, makes me feel better if you're getting the same thing from the show that I get from the books. Makes me feel good. Oh, definitely. And, you know, even if I had more time to prepare and look at the information I'd given, I probably could have given a, a deeper, more complex answer about the Sean Chan and what I've gathered. You know, like I listening to their King talk, uh, whenever we come up in Ishmael and... Uh, that lady with the the fingernails and ink tar all and in, in front of them. Yeah. There was some stuff that I noticed with that. You know how they are heavily influencing and guiding him to conflict, mm -hmm. and why he might want it. He wants it on his terms and maybe a different way. But they are, in a way, forcing his hand. Um. You know. What What's the saying? It's uh act now and ask for apologies later or whatever you know right better but, better uh, to ask for forgiveness than permission yeah exactly and this scene right here was was pretty cool gave a lot of uh maybe not a lot but it gave me a better understanding of the sean chan when you know you see him the king tarak lord tarak he's kind of upset that they went out to that city uh, you know that's beyond their reach you know, they can't hold this town. Obviously, they didn't take it in the name of the Sean Chan. Officially, they did, but it was really more so uh, for her and Ishmael, uh, which I think was all to lead to a certain moment. Um, right. But there was a different thing in this scene 
that really stuck out to me, and I got another piece of uh, evidence against Inktar. Uh-oh. There is four dark friends and one spot right here. And three are confirmed. You have Ishmael. You have uh, Lady Suroth. Sur Suroth. Yeah, Suroth. And uh, Pat and Fane. Okay. All and, right. I and I believe Ingtar. And the reason I believe Ingtar is because it's so strange how Ingtar leads them to that city uh, where they got captured. Him, Loyal, and Perrin and all them. Right. Uh, I mean, he. it didn't look that way, but he's obviously the leader of the pack. He was leading that group, and they ended up there. Uh, ends up with Ishmael in that group. And so they all get taken prisoner, and it's just, to me, it's weird how Ingtar is now in a position of, like, this looks like private servitude uh, to these high individuals why would they take these people from some random village that just came under their control and put them in their immediate circle unless they already trusted them unless ishmael wanted to keep his people close like he does with lady Suroth with pat on fame i i could see that i i see the argument i I know I could make the argument in another direction based on just what I know in general about the Sean Chan. Uh, 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 you know, I like your take on it because it, it backs up your, your claim that Inktar is a dark friend. Um, you know, and I, I, I feel like it's a, you're, you're building a pretty good groundwork for, for all of that. Uh, the only thing that I would, uh, the only thing that I know about this this servant position is a lot of people are put in that position that have status and titles in the lands that are conquered. So like a lot of like he's a he's some kind of commander from the borderlands. That's that would be a prized like if you could get him to be a servant that would lift up the Sean Chan in their eyes and an Ogier is unique in this in this version of the story. And making him a, a servant is is seen as like a, a way to raise status. So like, I see what you're saying, and I agree with it. And that's probably the way the show intended it. Uh, but them being made servants makes perfect sense to me, uh, not necessarily for like dark friend reasons. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, I I like your take. Um, also, yeah, I definitely agree with you. Also, also, this this scene right here that I have that I moved to uh, with Suroth, I it cropped out what she said, and what she said was uh, perhaps my lord made a mistake, and uh, bruh, that is such a huge, <laughs> like, that is like the biggest taboo ever. Like you don't you don't talk to a high lord like that, uh, not in Shan Chan lands, like. That's like grounds for execution, bro. Like, yeah. seriously. I think this girl has a problem with authority because she does the same thing to Ishmael. Yeah, she does. That's true. Like, you're, you're not five wrong. Five minutes later. Yeah. Uh, and I and then I took this screenshot of of Ishmael because when she said, "Perhaps my lord made a mistake," like Ishmael's like, "What are you doing, you crazy, you crazy person? <laughs> that is not, that is not the plan." Um, and then, uh, I just wanted to, I have this one pulled up because like you're talking about them being conquerors and, and this and that, but like part of the Sean Chan's like, uh, manifesto, I guess, is their whole arm, their whole culture exists to fight the shadow. So like everybody that's being conquered may see them as like these horrible people but like their stance is like legitimately them and the white cloaks are basically like the same as far as like we fight the shadow now what the shadow is is uh, a constant source of debate for everybody involved 
I definitely picked that up from the show because he had mentioned to fight the shadow with the light. I don't remember exactly how he how he put it. I'm really paraphrasing, but I do remember him mentioning the light. Right. And I was like, that that makes me think of the white cloaks, mm-hmm. and that that kind of made me see them as a colonizer, like a Rome or the Mayans or something, where they want to unite everybody to fight the dark, but under their rule, because they they think that that's the only way that they can win is to unite everybody and move as one force so that did come across to me in the show excellent that, that was their purpose and their drive that's that's excellent i uh, mean lord lord Turok says it right here in this scene does he okay i'm i'm almost there to where he's at um i did want to did want to see what you thought about this cuz like high lady Suroth and turok have these it's gross very long fingernails and to me they look um to me they look fake i don't know if the intention is to make those little gold pieces around the finger like just um decorative and they're supposed to hold the fingernails or if these are supposed to be like you just get to put them on like i don't know what the impression Mm -hmm. was that you got because like turok looks really awkward in them and uh I just didn't know what your impression was. Yeah, so I think that, you know, in this world, they're probably real. Yes. But when you're dealing with actresses and actors, you have to take some liberties and some props. And right. so they put those fake fingernails on them and they use the gold uh, to look like decoration. But in reality, it anchors the long fingernails on them because it'd probably be extremely hard to find a glue that's strong enough to glue them down without really fucking their fingers up in the long term. Right. Um, and so, you know, it does look a little off to me, but that's one of those things I chalk up to just stretch your imagination a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to, just wanted to touch on that. Like just a little bit, like it's not even, Like, those are supposed to be real. So, like, getting your fingernails chopped off and uh, the long fingernails, obviously, they take a long time to grow. So, like, the length of your fingernails, how many are long, is all a way for, like, Sean Chan to see, like, instant where you stand in the the pecking order, I guess. So, Mm -hmm. like, having her stuff get chopped off is brutal. Like, damn. I sent her away was like, I don't want to see you until you're presentable. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, this was interesting too, because Ishamael talking to the, to Turok is kind of, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like he would have got yelled at, but you know, they're, they're taking some liberties and I think, I think it's okay. Um, and the, <laughs> this scene, this scene plays out a little different, but I did, I did kind of, um, I, I just love watching Pot and Fane walk cause he's got that, that gigantic swagger. Yeah. This, this guy needs to be wearing gray sweatpants. You know what I mean? <laughs> he needs a long fur coat. Yeah. It's like a feather in that hat. Maybe That's a hose right. to give you some more respect. That's right. It's and... a little Dukes and Hazard. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, this, Man, I'm uh, really, I'm hair, really ups- hair and blade master right here. Yeah, I'm, I'm upset that it's cutting, cropping out of my, cropping out my, um, my dang, um, what do you call it? I'm upset that it's cropping out my um, captions or whatever. Try something. Ah, oh, shoot. There we go. So, he recognizes the Horn of Valier in the box with no, no lead up to that. Yeah, I was a little suspicious about that too. And he knew how to open it exactly as soon as it got in his lap. Yeah, and I, you know, we we can chalk some stuff up to show magic, but I just thought it 
te- technically he does know how to open the box, but he doesn't know what it is um, in the book. So I think they're, you know, kind of mishmashing a couple things. I think it's, uh, I think it's okay. He actually does know how to open the box. Like that, that wasn't uh because the Sean Chan technically they all know the the old tongue like these guys do the guys that are in charge and the the box historically has the old tongue anyways it makes sense that he can open it he's my only my only nitpick was that he wasn't actually supposed to know what was in there but you know it's fine um this is oh, this is what you were talking about, I guess, with Suroth and Ishamael arguing like right after that. She didn't learn her le- lesson, obviously. No. No, and then um, I'm not sure where it happens in this episode, but <clears throat> my next uh, picture is it threw me for a loop. Is uh. Is she and Rand having a private moment? Uh, yeah. When I saw that, I was like, what the fuck? Like, I don't remember this from the, <laughs> the first time through. <laughs> and, then, and then it makes sense. Yeah, I'm feel, feeling the, the tingles. Got me a little hot and bothered in here. Yeah. You want you ever gone camping? <laughs> um. So, I think uh, this... This slide with Rand and Ishamayo ends up Ishamayo ends up being uh, Lanfear, right? I want to say, am I wrong? Ishamayo? No, Rand ends up being Lanfear. Lanfear. Yeah. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, that's that's why the next slide makes more sense. Yeah, because he's dreaming right now. Right. Right. Um. trying to get to a spot where we can I really liked this episode and, and I'm sure we'll get to it later but I just I like getting the backstory to land fair like I had said that in the last episode I was like man I really would like to see maybe a flashback of them in their past life or even just more more depth to their relationship and you see between Rand and Moraine when they talk about land fear like her and her past and their past life with Luz Theron. And, you know, you learn about them being together and then basically, I guess he leaves her and that's what drove her to the dark. See, I was under the impression she was already working for the dark and they just fell in love or whatever, Mm. or I didn't really know what depth to the story there was, but obviously she started to fall in love with him. Um, but I thought maybe he didn't want to be with her because of her darkness. But I think that that was really just pretty cool to find out that she didn't even, she wasn't a dark friend until after he broke her heart. Right. Yeah, that's... That makes a that, ton more sense. Yeah, that's the story that, that I understand, um, is he left her for what would become his wife, and uh, that kind of pushed her over the edge. Now she's got a, yeah. a very singular purpose for her whole existence. So, um, this statement right here, uh, Ishamel wants to stop the wheel. Like, uh, I don't know what you took away from that. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this scene between them two really showed both their true intentions. One, this is where he first mentions, at least that I can think of, he wants to stop the will. He wants everything to stop. And and to be free, to stop this reincarnation, stop this life. Um, so I, I see that this is them dropping the, the foundation. This is his purpose. This is his goal that he's driving for. If I if I remember correctly, he was saying it as if it's in like this is what the Dark Lord wants, like his master wants this. Right. Um but I just remember from my recollection from the first time through, 
I just remember Ishamael really harping on this. Like, I want the will to stop. I just want, like, everything to quit going through this crushing cycle, this painful cycle. And at the same time in this scene, you see Lanfear kind of jokingly be like, you know, like, I could betray you, you know? And that kind of, to me, drops some hints that, like, her loyalties truly lie with her love for Rand, I think, above all else. Right. And she, if Rand, like, would whisper in her ear, like, flip on a Shamael, she would do that shit in a heartbeat. If it meant that she got Rand. That's a interesting take. Not going to answer one way or the other. But I, I like the, yeah. I like the, like, again, the show's doing a, a good job of portraying these people, like, quickly. That was something that I took away at the end of the first season, because you kind of go along with Lanfear, and in the book, there's some things she doesn't do that she does in the show, where, like, she's with Moraine and ran through the way gates and whatnot, and, like, involved in the story, but you kind of get this a little bit like Matt where she has these moments of uh, redeemable traits and you see that like yes she is 100% a savage and ruthless but you can see that she truly wants Rand and that is what's important to her even over her own um, cruelty you know right maybe I'm, I'm making the I'm making this more complicated than it needs to be but I'm just saying that that is Something that I took away from the first time I watched this was Lanfear to me seems like of all the dark friends, the one that's loyalties don't truly lie with the Dark Lord. It lies with Rand. But if she doesn't get Rand, then she'll, you know, use them to get to him. Right. No, I I think uh, I think you got Lanfear nailed down pretty much. And that's good. I mean, that's that's what I want. Um, I really want to skip this slide because it makes me angry. But um, yeah, I I would like if we could to go next into the. Um, I mean, we can wrap this up however you want, but just the next subject to kind of be the uh, Elias Perrin um, stuff. Uh, um, and Dane Bornhold. Yeah, I can do that. Um, I'm just going to skip through the, the girl slides and we can come back to them. Okay. Give me a second. Uh, okay, I think this is it. Yeah. Yeah, so sweet. You have the... Uh... My first note about Perrin is this right here. Damn, I'm good. Yeah, my my note is uh, when do when do Perrin's eyes change? I didn't know that that was gonna be a permanent thing. Um. Well, do you remember the the scene where Egwene and Perrin are stuck in the White Cloak camp? Mm-hmm. So that's like the events unfold a little differently, but pretty much from that moment on, his eyes are golden. It's a constant source of uh, discomfort for Perrin because he always feels like everybody's looking at his eyes instead of him. Yeah, well, (laughs) your eyes are gold, dog. (laughs) It's going to draw some attention. Yeah, it kind of, like, the golden eyes, um, he's not afraid to go into a town, uh, but he's kind of defensive about it. Like, he's constantly expecting somebody to like lash out I guess yeah um let's see something that came up right after this was I think I think it might be a couple slides uh but Elias says that the two river folk and his wife were not his pack and I felt like that was Yeah. It just made me stop to think like that's that's an important thing for Elias to say. 
Um, because obviously, you know, Perrin comes from the two rivers. Why? I mean, I get it. He's got the ties to the the Wolf Brothers or whatever, but uh, it just it's something that makes me think as to why he would say that to him, even his wife. You know, that's a mate that he chose. Was he expecting him to do choose a wolf? Like some bestiality stuff. I I don't quite understand unless there's like wolf brother women out there. Uh, not to my knowledge. And uh, remember, remember, his wife does doesn't exist in the books, so they're kind of yeah. Uh, I did see an interesting theory that um that Layla was a dark friend, and her dying was not part of the plan. Ooh, okay. I saw a theory about it, but I don't know. I mean, she was also pregnant with parents' kid, allegedly, so I think we've gathered enough clues for that. But, you know, I don't know. This doesn't, uh, this kind of straightforward conversation doesn't really happen. So I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer one way or the other. Um, No, but I think it just adds to the mystery or the mystery of like, what is Perrin? Where does he come from? Why is this? I feel like all these people end up in the two rivers and they come from this place, but yet none of them do. Nynaeve is an orphan. Right. Rand's an orphan. Perrin is obviously this like wolf hybrid that sees visions and his pack now is telling him that he doesn't belong to the two rivers. And I'm like, okay. So the only one that does is Matt and Egwene, I guess. Like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know where the takes uh, away from their identity. Yeah, I don't know where the show's gonna take it. I mean, uh, Rand being the dragon and Egwene uh, going in the direction she's going, Nine, like all these characters going in the direction they're going, like, um. I don't think any of them like traditionally like break their bond and say, I'm, I'm never going home, but like in the direction that they're heading, a lot of them aren't. Uh, so like, I, I can kind of see what Elias is trying to say here, but, um, maybe it was just like, uh, like maybe they were trying to get something across that is just one of those things that didn't, didn't uh, translate well, so I, you know, I'm not worried about it. Um, I uh-uh. did. He does. He bro. does. He does say this too. Can't run from what you are, boy. Which is, uh, which is true. Can't can't get out of is it. You a werewolf? Uh, no, not not quite. Not a, they can't, bro. If they shape change, I will never watch another episode. <laughs> That'd be funny as shit. I would be infuriated through the roof. I'd just turn my, turn the stream off and never watch it again. Um, I did. Uh, what is this? What's him looking at Uno in a cage? Oh. Oh yeah, you're right. They never buried him. Nice. This is uh right whenever he's about to break up break open Uno's cages when he meets the Ayo woman. Is that how you would say it? It's yeah. not Ayoman. Right. She's Aiel, so she would be an Aiel woman. Yeah, I've just I've heard it like they call him Aiel men so much that I just assume that that's like their their name their title right i hope you i hope you continue to read the books because i really want you to meet the person that's supposed to be in this cage because it's such a good character like this is one of those things where the show kind of had to mash things together to make it work and that's fine Mm -hmm. but i really i really hope you continue to read and get to this essentially this scene and meet who it's supposed to be because uh it's one of my it's one of my favorite characters in the whole in the whole series there's like is it huh who is it his name is gall g-a-u-l yeah gall okay and uh 
he's him and Perrin are they stick together all the way to the end. So it's it's a good it's a good relationship. I hope they bring him into the show at some point. Uh, just because I I like I like the relationship that's portrayed, and uh, they can't have Avienda fill that role. Avienda is a true character from the book. Avienda is a true character from the book. Yes. She interact with Perrin at all? That is a good question. Um, a little, not a lot, okay. not a lot. All right. Man, that's a good question. Oh man. I'm going to stick with my answer. Not a lot, not enough to, uh, not enough for me to know exactly when and where, but yes. Um, then we parent gets over to, uh, Dane. I love Dane. Dane's dude. He's, he's great. They did a good job on him. I've got some, I've got some weird vibes from this dude. Yeah. Why is that? Yeah. Not, not like a dark friend. Cause I, I'm gonna get the, uh, the boy who cried wolf. I'm gonna just start labeling everybody as a dark friend, and but no, just, uh, make you a good white cloak. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be a good questioner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I just, uh, I like the little subtleties of his character that it's like, he's this very, I feel like when he meets Perrin, they have a very genuine, uh, meeting with each other for the first time. I, uh, I agree. You know, and you know, he kind of plays dumb because Perrin doesn't know that he's a white cloak because he's obviously wearing a big cloak over his white cloak. Um, right. And they make it back and they have their conversation and Perrin hears child Valda in the back, or maybe I don't think he heard him. Maybe he just saw some white cloaks. And so he starts freaking out and then he sees, uh, Dane's white cloak and he kind of gets a little nervous. Um, and I feel like Dane kind of saw that in him. Like right. saw him kind of like the stir a little bit, the discomfort or whatever. Yeah. And then whenever Perrin goes inside, he's obviously creeping through the window. Child Valda's out there and he sees him and he comes up and Dane says to Child Valda, you know, no wolves are here. No wolves here. And I was like, oh, bitch, what a word. What a word to use. Right. So that made me think that Dane knows Perrin on a deeper level than he's definitely playing off to be. Um, Dan, like along, like I have several uh, favorite characters. I think I said that just a minute ago with Avienda, <clears throat> but um, Dane is Dane is another one that I I like a lot. Um, his absolutely insane right hand man is not present, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean he won't show up later. Um, oh. but Dane, Dane, I feel is ultimately a good person, which is what the white cloaks strive to be, but not, a, not many of them, as you can see by Valdo, not, not many of them, um, excel at being a good person. Yeah. So I, I like Dane, Dane, and I think the character that he, he gives off, um, have you seen the Princess Bride? Yeah. <laughs> it gives it yeah. gives uh the Dread Pirate Roberts vibes. Like that uh Carrie Elwes that played uh the Dread Pirate Roberts Wesley. Yeah. That's the the vibe. If they ever did a remake, which they shouldn't, but if they did, this actor would be a good candidate at least. That's funny. Um but yeah, he like def basically defends Perrin or is just trying to do anything to irritate Valdo because Valdo's a questioner. Yeah, I think it's probably a bit of both. Yeah. You know? I did uh it, props to the costume department that red uh snake that is in the shape of a shepherd's crook around the sunburst mm -hmm. is 
uh, probably like 95% of what I envision in my head of the questioner's like logo, I guess. Hell yeah, good on them. I just, uh, I, I just think that there's usually purpose to everything that they put in the show. And him saying no wolves here, I feel like is a little detail that that has a deeper meaning to it. It could. I mean, we don't we don't know exactly where the show's going. My theory on that, uh, since you brought it up, is that um, Dane knew knew or heard about Valda's um, attack, where he get he gets attacked by the camp gets attacked by wolves. Mm -hmm. To me, it's like a little dig. Like, no worries, Valda. There's no wolf, there's no puppies here to worry about. Mm, that's a good point. Okay. Uh, that's what I took from it. Just knee gotcha. jerk, just knee jerk reaction. Um. Oh, this is where Perrin is uh, breaking her out, right? Yep. This whole this whole interplay, I think, is um, it misses a little bit for me specifically. Uh, but it was really close. I think it was just a little overdone. And we can talk about it if you if you really want to, but it's not like that important because there's not a lot of IO in this season. Um, I did want to, I do want to talk about this because I made sure I took a screenshot of uh, Avienda's face when Perrin's like panicking and like, I'll protect you. And uh, Avian is like, yeah, right, boy, whatever. <laughs> and uh, and then like when she, uh, I I actually did get chills. Uh, I got them just now again thinking about it. I I did get chills when Avian said, uh, "Do you like to dance?" Because uh, the IO call that call fighting the dance of spears. So. She put on her black, uh, black mask. Yeah, I actually hope they put the chant. Uh, I hope they put the chant in the show at some point. It's uh, like when you dance the spears. There's like a chant that they do, and it's pretty good. So, but th yeah, this scene right here was done well. Like everything after she stops talking, basically, because uh, like she basically knocks out everybody yeah by herself <laughs> i think parent helps a little um but i i enjoyed the choreography and it uh it is consistent because if you think back to like the scene with Rand's mom she was able to kill mm -hmm. like four people while fully pregnant and this is avienda not pregnant but she has been in a cage for a while uh, dehydrated, gets up, stretches for a few minutes, and then proceeds to whoop ass. Yeah, like that was that was good, good and consistent. Yeah, I mean it was. Uh, she's a fucking stud muffin, hundred percent. Yeah, I love Avienda. <laughs> she's great. There was a uh, something that she did say before we move on from Perrin. Um, but she said to Perrin when. They, they were out of this. I think it was the next morning um, when they were talking. It, I think Perrin was asking her, like, what what was she doing there? And she was like, I was looking for the the Kar Karn. Yeah. yeah. The Kar Karn. Uh, the Chief of Chiefs. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hmm. Because I remember you talking about how everybody had prophecies. And I was like, is this a prophecy? Is she really looking for like an actual person, like a dude that's already the car car or is she out there like looking for, you know, their, their King. Uh, and is that, is that Rand? Excellent question. That's what I thought when I saw this kind of spoiled when you get to episode eight, but yeah, that's a good question. Um, the, this whole this whole plot line um, 
So I will say that in the books, everything related to prophecy is kind of like treated with like, like a level of, uh, like lack of seriousness. Like I want to mm -hmm. say the word like blase because the the author, the one of the author's like whole points is that the prophecies have to be fulfilled. So like at some point in the series uh rand literally says um i might as well go fulfill this one while i'm at it <laughs> <laughs> to, to somebody to somebody's prophecy and it was just yeah. it, was, it was funny because at that point like enough has happened in the books where you're like all right this is this is the dude and so he goes and like fulfills like two or three back to back and then he like looks at whoever it was that he's irritated with and he's like, see what, like what more do you want from me? But, uh, yeah, she's searching for the car Karn. They don't have Kings, but they do have chiefs of their individual tri or clans. And, uh, this is the chief of chiefs. So I hope we get to see some, I hope we get to see an Aiel clan chief next season. Uh, cause that's important for, for that to happen. Yeah, I think we will. I, I think, think we're so. going to see somewhere new because they filmed so much in South Africa. Oh, yeah. We're going to the waste. Yeah. If they if they filmed in South Africa, we're going to the waste. Um, so that's that's good news. I'm that's really good news. Um, so. I know what they. I know what the directors tried to do with with the way the Aiel speak to wetlanders, and uh, I'll probably do like a solo stream or like a nitpicky or just like a, I would like to see it done different stream addressing like all of these little quirks or whatever, but like the Aiel don't like they're not conf they're confused but not in like a I'm sorry way. It's more like this is really what you guys. Like you actually think, um, like they're they're confused by the customs of the people on this side of the of the mountains, but like they're clever, they're they're only confused and afraid of like a handful of things. Everything else, they really just kind of they're chill and go like they take everything in stride, like uh, like if they're in danger of dying they're like uh you know we may wake from the dream it's not anything to bat an eye at like everything is very very stoic i guess is the right word and if you don't know what that means you can look it up but like wow what a dick move i was talking i was gonna put that on uh youtube what do you mean what a dick move <laughs> stoicism some people have it. Some people call call talks uh, dick moves. Uh, I guess. <laughs> I'll let the people decide. Yeah, get in the comments. Um, no, but like, I it's so hard to explain. I'm not surprised that the it it's like missing just a just a little bit. Uh, I would really have to like pull a scene from the book and show you what I'm talking about uh, for it to make sense. So I'm not worried about it. I just I hope they they get the same feeling going back through the footage and when they reshot that they kind of addressed it a little bit. Yeah, um, makes sense. Anyways, do you want to talk about the girls or do you want to talk about uh, Rand next? Or act, uh, actually, we might need to stop here soon because it's already six fifty. Yeah, how about we just wrap up with Aaron? It's a quick okay. arc. Yeah, let me get over there to her. Do, 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 do. Some good scenes uh, with Rand and uh, yeah. Lanfear here. Okay, I think I yeah I went too far. Okay. So Varen shows up at the tower, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's our opening scene with her. And uh, 
I just got to say, like, I like the interaction of her with the other Brown sisters. With uh, Yasuka and Naomi? Yeah. 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 I enjoyed that whole interplay of, of discussion. Um, I did it. I'm trying to see where they where they say it. Uh, they say it in this scene, the first one that I had pulled up, where they're all together. Uh, they make it sound like Varen is retired. I don't, I don't think she's retired. Yeah. I don't, I don't think she is. I could be wrong, but I don't think she is. She is out writing a book or doing research for one, so that's true. But I was like, I don't, I don't think she's retired. Not that it matters. But it, it does, uh, it is an easy way to explain, like, the easy way she's talking to people that she hasn't seen in a long time. It explains, like, the immediate loyalty that she gets. So it makes sense to put it in the show. And I, yeah. like, based on what happens in this story arc, like, I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, so this is... This whole scene here was pretty interesting. Like this whole little short arc, like you said, is short, but it's it's got a lot of stuff to it, some layers. Yeah, I would say I probably have more notes about Varen in this episode than I do about anybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it says... Uh... It says Varen is awfully interested in Nynaeve and Egwene. Is what you mm -hmm. wrote down? Yeah, because she like comes in and she brings that up to her brown sisters, and she comes in, she brings it up with the mistress of uh, novices, and she brings it up with Leander. Like every time she talks to somebody, she's like, "Where are these two girls at? Right. I want to see them. That's what I'm here for. Right. And so that just stands out. That's her motive to me. Um, and in this scene right here, you see that she holds some weight here and, and I wrote that Varen holds weight before I followed it up with what came after um, but just by the reaction she got from the Brown sisters the reaction she got from the mistress of novices I feel like she whenever she has her moment with Leandrin and we can get to that Leandrin seems threatened by Varen right but, yeah uh, I, got, I, got the uh, I got that vibe too but in this, you see, you know, Yazika goes through the novice's book, which to me is, you know, there's that, there's that, you know, I don't, I don't remember what you call them, like houses or colors that little like, you know, they're sticking together with their group, you right. know, like the Browns are investigating, you know, she's going in somebody else's off, office, which, you know, can be kind of looked down upon with what she's doing. She's going behind somebody's back to look through her book. But uh, oh yeah, if she got yeah, caught, and, if she got caught, she'd be uh fucking roasted. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, she's doing that by Varen's. Yeah, Varen. Varen. I mean, look. If you look at Yaska's um, like her posture and her body language, she's a hundred percent willing to do it. Like she was excited about the. <laughs> the es espionage, uh, aj the ajas, I think is the word you were wanting to use. The the color, the color differences. Yeah, yeah, the ajas. Um, and I was interested in this statement because obviously that's not true. Yeah, but I was trying to figure out what they were planning on doing with that because yeah. Right. So I think Leandrin used compulsion on um, the mistress of novices to write that. Okay, because that they do because, talk about like the handwriting being a little different or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Varen is the one that brings it up, and she was like, "Do you think it could be somebody used compulsion on her?" Oh, I have the to write that. I have the slide for it. Damn, I'm good. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that may I mean that makes sense. At least they explain it. I don't like hearing Aes Sedai tell uh straight up lies because it raises lots yeah. of red flags. 
Um, by the way, we talk about like uh, people being people being mentioned. Um, Elaine's brother Gowan. Gowan is uh, Gowan and Elaine also have a brother named Galad. So they haven't name dropped him yet, but I'm uh, if if Gowan is coming into the picture at some point, it's going to be interesting. I I like him a lot. A lot of people hate his guts, but I like him. Sweet. Um, and then compulsion. Oh, that's right. Because they, when they talk, she's like, uh, "How is that possible? There's no way you could use a weave of compulsion." So, uh, and I didn't get a, I didn't get a good picture of Varen and Leandrin, but uh, I got, I tried to capture like Varen's face of like, "Are you serious right now?" Because uh, I don't remember what they were talking about, but Varen's like, uh, "I doubt, I doubt what you're saying." <laughs> That was the, the last note I had. Was yeah. uh, Varen doesn't buy Landrin's bullshit. And what what she was doing yeah. was she was asking Leandrin about the girls, and she was like, "Oh yeah, you know, like I don't know what happened to them." Blah blah blah. And she was like, Varen was like, "Huh? Well, I saw that they were signed out to go to a name day ceremony." And then Leandrin was like, "Oh, well, I heard on the road that like there was a caravan that was attacked. Oh, we, that's we should right. Go. We should go." And then she was like running away and she looked back at Varen and she was like, what are you doing? Let's go. And Varen was like, bitch, <laughs> like, I, I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing. And you could see it on Leandra's face. Like, I, I think that she felt threatened. Yeah. And I mean, kudos to the actress because she's getting that across to me. You know, I feel like I'm seeing that in her. Oh, yeah. The the. The skill level of the actresses and the actors in this show as a whole are like they're doing a great job. And I want to say that a lot of it is like the actors themselves, but also the direction. They don't know to make those faces unless somebody tells them to. So yeah. like good, good on them. Uh, I, I'm really excited to finish this episode, um, but we'll have to we'll have to cut it short for right now. Yeah. And uh but yeah, we can talk about it some more uh when we get another chance. And I uh Yeah, I want to I don't know I don't know when we'll have a chance to finish. Um I'm busy the rest of the day. I do think uh I'm leaving work tomorrow early. And I'm pretty sure I have Friday through Monday off, or Friday through Sunday off. Sweet. So depends. Yeah. On... Uh, we'll see tomorrow. Tomorrow uh, I have classes late into the afternoon. That's my lawn day. Yeah. Uh, and then baseball starts tomorrow night. It's opening day of baseball. Baseball. So I. Uh, yeah, I want to see. Uh, I want to see my defending champs back out on the field for the first time um i think their game starts at like seven or eight o'clock i think it's seven my time but uh we can see about friday or, or something you know i've got a three-day weekend as well so yeah we've we, at this point we've streamed for like four days straight probably be good to take a day uh but uh i mean T technically these streams cut into my time where I can shower so I haven't showered in like two days because I'm racing home to get on the computer gross yeah well uh definitely want you to shower so uh I yeah, think tomorrow I, should be a, a hygiene day I can smell you from here <laughs> I can't smell you but you looking a little you looking a little dusty yeah it was windy today we had a uh, <laughs> <Is it when? laughs> we've we've had uh three high wind days in a row monday monday was peaking at like 55 mile an hour gusts well and today was uh st sustained like 20 mile an hour winds all day like pretty much 
So that's a doesn't sound fun. One of my biggest regrets is not buying a like a sturdy kite to have on have on site, so that when it's windy, I can like go outside and you know if I'm out there anyway, I might as well fly a little kite, have have some fun with it. I wouldn't be able to get the big giant two-hander ones because it would literally pick me up and throw me into some power lines. So, but. I thought it'd be it's funny. If, the move. I thought it'd be funny if I got like a little kid one, like a Disney, I don't know, princess, like, like Cinderella or something. I just, what is that, Mike? It's uh, Cinderella. You got a problem with it? Yeah. And then you can dip your beard in glitter and put it in ponytails and just go the full nine yards, man. I told you about that, didn't I? <laughs> That's funny. You did. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Oh, shit. Jeez. All right, well, I got to go. Uh, this was, this yep. was a really good, nice, nice, tight, and uh, organized discussion. And it felt good. Yeah. This was good. Episode five Sweet. is good. It was a, a good episode and still a lot of juicy stuff to talk about. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, we'll uh, take a break tomorrow and uh, reconvene sometime sometime soon yeah we'll figure it out all right man all right enjoy your night Uh, you too